it definitely was psychological. In the back of my mind, there was this constant, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I don't even know why I'm sorry, but I'm sorry. So please know that I'm sorry and don't send me to hell. Hell was way down the line in topics of discussion. It was, certainly was never used as like a motivator. Emotionally, I remember getting to the point later in life where I just felt sort of numb toward God, like not feeling like I could really love him because it felt like he was holding a gun to my head. I always just felt like the separation between Jesus and, and Father, right? And Father was the mean guy and Jesus was the good guy. Yeah. Jesus came to save us from Father. From Dad. It just was never this thing that like, so, you know, if you don't do this, you're going to hell. If this is your first time, you're like, what is happening right now? <laughs> if this is your first time, we are wrapping up our series on hell. Uh, we've been looking at a historical look at it from the early church fathers until today, um, and just even, you know, different viewpoints throughout history, and today is the final one. So I say that because if you uh, are just walking into this, uh, it's just a historical teaching, but also you need to go listen to the other ones. Uh, week one was huge because it was the history of hell. I just walked through different uh, historical viewpoints and, and where the concept came from and, and all that stuff. Um, and so that one's super important. Um, but again, this one is just kind of focused on one view, but there's two other views that we've discussed. So please go listen to those. Also today, there is just a ton of information, ton, ton, ton of information. So you will probably have to listen to this sermon a couple times, um, unless you're some super genius and you can just remember all this, that'd be awesome too. But um, you're, this is a lot of information to take in. So I know you're going to be thinking about stuff, but just kind of stick with me and then go listen to it again, because I don't want you to miss what I'm talking about while you're over here thinking about something else, okay? So this is super important. Keep up with this and um, as we wrap this up. So all three views that we've looked at agree on this. So I like to start with what they agree on because so many times when you start preaching on something, uh, you know, people think like, well, it means this. Well, no, it doesn't. And that's what I'm breaking down. But this is what every view agrees on uh, of hell. Hell is a place where sin is dealt with. They're all based on scripture, which I want to show you today. They, those who reject Christ have a punishment. There's no eternal life without allegiance to Jesus Christ, meaning Jesus Christ is the way. And all three views agree on that. So today, we are looking at ultimate reconciliation, or it's better known as universalism. That's how the Western church talks about this. Um, it's just universalism. And here's what the kind of the summary of what this view is. I just ran. I need to take a break. <laughs> I just ran from the stage, and Gonzaga's playing. I mean, it's so hard. So uh, what are you guys doing here? Gonzaga's playing, right? Uh, so here's the view. God desires that everyone would be saved and none should perish. Since God alone has the power to redeem and restore everyone, God then fulfills his desire through the finished work of Christ who came to reconcile the world back to God. The punishment endured by the unrepentant in the afterlife is intended to correct and restore them into a right relationship with God, not torture for all eternity. It's, it's meant to, it's like a father disciplining his kids, so they come back to the right way. So that's kind of a nutshell of what we're going to look at today. Here's an interesting quote that I have found true in my own walk, as has our staff and everyone at this church. Bishop Robinson says this about the American church. It's funny, isn't it, that you can preach a judgmental and vengeful and angry God and nobody will mind. But you start preaching a God that is too accepting, too loving, too forgiving, too merciful, too kind, then you are in trouble. I have found this to be the case. And uh, I'm going to break this down a little bit more, but it's, it's interesting that when you start talking about a God who um, does accept people, meaning he accepts them so they can change, um, and he's too merciful, too grace-filled, that is what actually gets you in trouble in the Christian church, which is kind of odd to me. But it's a true statement. Many have been called heretics just talking about universalism. Uh, just even mentioning it, so many people are branded a heretic. And it, this is what's interesting about that word heretic. One, we, we've totally misused what it was for. Um, and why they used it. But 
Do you realize you can go onto YouTube and type in any one of your favorite preachers? Uh, I'm number one, of course, but, and there's somebody calling them a heretic. There's somebody calling them a heretic. So this is just a, a, a Christian thing that we love to do because we love to feel right and we love to feel like we're on the right side. My aim is to show you today that that's not true. If you walk out of here and you're not a universalist, that's okay. I said that week one, you have to decide where you fit in. Our goal is to share the good news of Jesus right here, right now. It's not gonna change. But we're gonna put this to rest that this is heresy because you're basically calling some really amazing church fathers heretics. Augustine, um, as I mentioned in week one, he was kind of one of the main preachers once Rome uh, kind of took over the church, which did a lot of damage, by the way, because they started uh, uh, connecting church and state, which they were never supposed to do. But Augustine was a leading guy in this, and he even wrote this. He wrote, there are very many in our day who, though not denying the Holy Scriptures, do not believe in endless torments. So first off, notice he says there was a lot of early church fathers and mothers who believed in universalism. And then he said, and they weren't denying the scriptures. They weren't saying, oh, it's not found in the Bible. They, they believed in the scriptures. It's found in the Bible. So even Augustine referenced that. He's like, no, these are good Christians. They just have a different view of this. Basil the Great, what an amazing name. When I'm dead, you guys better call me Scott the Great, Okay. <laughs> My wife's like, mm hmm. Uh, Basil the Great writes this The mass of men says there is to be an end to punishment and to those who are punished. Clement of Alexandria was a, a bishop. I mean, he was like the guy during his time. He wrote, We can set no limits to the agency of the Redeemer to redeem, to rescue, to discipline in his work, and so will he continue to operate after this life. So week one, again, I talked about how that word eternal means ages of time, not necessarily eternity. It's just kind of the next age. And Clement of Alexandria said, you, God can do whatever he wants in eternity. He can do whatever he wants in the next life too. So they didn't limit God to just this one life, which we have done. We've done that in the Christian church. Again, week one, I told you Revelation says, I hold the keys to death in Hades. That's what Jesus said. And I trust him with the keys. But you also got to believe that that means there's some other stuff going on this side of the grave. My favorite one is Gregory of Nyssa. I love him. Just a little explanation of him. Again, I mentioned him in week one, but he was the head of the Nicene Council. When they got together, the church got together to form a creed, the Nicene Creed, which was basically um, uh, some hills that they were going to die on and other hills they weren't going to die on. So they wrote this creed so everyone was focused. Everyone was in agreement at, for the main things. I really wish the American church could come together and write a creed. It would change a lot. But he was the head of this. He was the head of that. Not only that, he was one of the members who put the Bible together. He was one of the final says in which books went into the Bible. He was a universalist. My point with that is, if this was such heresy and it's something that needs to be squashed, why would they even allow this guy on the council? Why would they even allow him to have such a huge role? But he writes this. Wherefore, that at the same time, this is kind of old English too, so you'll get the point though. Wherefore, at the same time, liberty of free will should be left to nature and yet the evil be purged away. The wisdom of God discovered this plan to suffer man to do what he would, that having tasted the evil which he desired and learning by experience for what wretchedness he had bartered away the blessings he had, he might of his own will hastened back with desire to the first blessedness either being purged in this life through prayer and discipline or after his departure, hence through the furnace of cleansing fire. So basically he was like, you follow Jesus now and you follow Christ and he, he gets this sin out of your life now or he's gonna do it later. I think we should do it now. <laughs> we should choose it now, but that's what he believed. He believed that, that it was a, a cleansing fire. That's what fire does. Fire cleanses things, fire, it wrecks them, but then they, uh, they grow better after that. So that's how he viewed this. Again, in week one, I talked about just that theory of Calvinism, which Augustine is who brought that in. It's really the main theology that has affected the Western church. Um, a brief overview, Calvinism basically says that God is sovereign, he's in control, he's pulling the strings. I believe in that, by the way. But what it also goes on to say is that God picks and chooses who he wants in heaven. He picks you over here on this side to, for his glory, but he, he made you just for wrath, just for his wrath. That's the Calvinistic viewpoint. That has affected all denominations in America. 
So basically they have a saying that says it's irresistible grace. If meaning, if God wants you, he's gonna get you. You cannot deny his grace. His grace is irresistible and you will come to him because of his grace, but not everyone. So here's the interesting thing about that view. Universalism is just Calvinism with more people. That's all it is. It's that God wanted all of you and God's not gonna stop until he gets you. So it's really the same belief. It's just some are, are cast away in the other view. So I think that's interesting that it's actually not that far off. That universalism says his grace is going to get you. You're, you're never gonna say no to this forever. So let me start with this. I told you in week one, I was gonna tell you where I sit, where I land right now in my view of hell. And I'm gonna actually tell you right now instead of at the end. Where I currently sit after years of studying this and thinking about it is I am an annihilationist. Meaning, again, if you're new with us, that means that those who reject Christ will um, go um, suffer for their sins or be punished for their sins. And then God, after the punishment, will just annihilate them. They don't exist anymore. They're done. They're gone. I, am, yeah, I do not believe that God's going to torture people for all eternity. That just, that's not the Jesus that I know. That just doesn't sound right. So I, I'm out of that camp. But annihilationism makes sense to me because one, it is the most literal view in the Bible. I mean, we, we, we studied that two weeks ago. It's, it's right there. It's literal. Um, and also, the one reason I believe that is it's still on God. It's still on God. Salvation's on God, and so is that. Meaning, if he loses billions of his children and they're annihilated, you won't know it. We won't know it. We're just gone. But he's the one who has the pain for all eternity. And I believe it's his way of taking responsibility for creating us. Here's what I mean. I didn't ask to be born. And I didn't ask to be born sinful. And I didn't ask to be born with genetics that made me go bald when I was in my 20s. And I didn't ask, I didn't ask to have this fallible body that my knee, I'm getting knee surgery in two weeks, got a torn meniscus, didn't even know it. I didn't ask for any of this and you didn't ask for it either. Now, does God need our permission? No. But I think that's a little unfair that he creates us in this fallen, broken world and then judges us for that for all eternity. So it's, it's his way of still taking responsibility for creating us. Salvation is on him and so is death. But let me say this, just like in politics, most of you won't just admit you're a liberal. Most of you won't just admit you're a right-wing conservative. We always say, well, I'm in the middle, but I lean one way, right? That's a good way to look at it because I can look at certain things on this side and be like, yeah, I kind of agree with that, but not all that. And I can do that with the other side. So when you're in the middle, by the way, I believe Christians are supposed to be in the middle because then we can take every issue as it is. But I'll be honest, if you're gonna be in the middle, you're not gonna make anybody happy. I have found that. I am not a progressive Christian. I am not a right-wing Christian because Jesus never told us to take those labels. So we say we lean certain ways. I am an annihilationist, but I lean heavily towards universalism. I lean heavily towards it, and I wanna show you why today. I have no problem hoping that Christ is going to save all men because 1 Corinthians told us we should. 1 Corinthians 13 says, love bears all things, love believes all things, love hopes all things, and love endures all things. Love never ends. So if love is the highest virtue that there is in the universe, and it tells me we should hope, we should hope all men eventually get in. We should hope that. And I love what Dan said once. He goes, if you don't at least hope everyone's gonna get in, you're kind of just a jerk. I mean, that's true. At least hope for it. Like, why wouldn't you want that? Why wouldn't you be excited about that? So I wanna get you guys excited that this is a possibility. So before I get into this, uh, there's a scripture part. We're gonna plow through it. The early church fathers read the Bible in three ways. They read it from the historical context, they read it from the moral context. Like, what was God trying to teach us? Because we can get all the facts we want. That doesn't mean nothing. What's the moral context here? Finally, they said, as you mature, you move into the spiritual understanding of the scriptures. Paul said the Bible's spiritual. So here's why that's important. is because you'll become a fundamentalist if you don't do that. 
you'll, you'll pick certain scriptures and hold, hold those over people, and it's just fundamentalism. When the Bible was poetry, it was high, uh, apocalyptic hyperbole, and so the early church fathers believed you have to move from just this black or white view of things and move into the spiritual. And so ultimate reconciliation really is in this kind of upper spiritual realm when you look at the scriptures. So first we're gonna look at Revelation. Now, as I said a couple weeks ago, <laughs> Our view of Revelation, I have a different view of Revelation. Um, we have used Revelation as a way to predict the future and find the Antichrist and all kinds of stuff. And I don't believe the book of Revelation is linear. It's not this happens, this happens, this happens, this happens. It's circular. It's describing the same event over and over. The cross and the resurrection, the cross and the resurrection, the cross and the resurrection. Because John wrote this book to those people at that time. So it had to make sense to them. And if we can't admit that the book of Revelation is so much symbolism and so much poetry, we're going to miss it. So I, I mentioned Revelation and showed you that it says death in Hades is destroyed. So that, that fits annihilationism, that it's just gone, it's over. Now throw all that out and let me walk you through Revelation with a view of ultimate reconciliation or universalism and you see the hope in this, okay? Stick with me. Revelation 21. First, let me say this too, though. I just want you to know, if you want to know what's going on in the world, read the book of Revelation. I believe it is circular. It, it's, it's, it's showing you this is what the world's about. It's happening today. And I make a promise to you, if some guy or some gal comes along and wants to run the world and says you have to take a mark on your hand or your forehead or you can't eat, I'm going to warn you not to take that. And I hate to tell you, if that does happen, we all gonna die, Okay? But praise Jesus, right? I promise I will warn you, but I'm not gonna go on these trails anymore where it's like, Russia's coming, the Chinese are coming, this is coming, this is the Antichrist. So far in my lifetime, Reagan's been the Antichrist, Bill Clinton's been the Antichrist, Michael Jackson's been the Antichrist. That would have been amazing. Uh, Obama's been the Antichrist, Bush, they've all been the Antichrist. So I promise to warn you, but I'm not, I just, I think there's something else going on. Revelation 21, okay? So we're in 21. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. He never said, I make all things new, except for this flaming garbage pit where people are tortured forever. He never said that. I make all things new. Also, he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, it is done. Where else did Jesus say that? On the cross, it is finished, it's over, it's done. This is describing the cross. I am the alpha and the omega. I always thought that'd be such a good like rap, right? I'm the alpha, I'm the omega, like it'd be a good one. The beginning and the end, to the thirsty, I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. That sounds like grace, without payment. So, death and Hades at this point in Revelation 19, they've already been destroyed, they've already been thrown in hell, and now it's finished, it's over. This is a picture of the cross, so picture it that way. Then it goes on to Revelation 21, 24, meaning the city. So then it says the city of God is, is birthed. By its light will the nations walk, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. I thought they were all dead. From the American view, they've all been destroyed. Now they're back and its gates will never be shut by day, and there will be no night there, and they will bring into it the glory and the honor of the nations, but nothing unclean will ever enter it, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. Again, do you see the hope? Picture this from a hope. This is, death in Hades is gone, death is over, hell is over, and now the nations come in and bring their glory to God. Now go to Revelation 22. Then the angel showed me the river of water of life, bright as a crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city. Also, on either side of the river, the tree of life, there it is again, with its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. They will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads. Interesting. And night will be no more. They will need no light or lamp or sun for the Lord God will be their light and they will reign forever and ever. 
Death in Hades has been destroyed on the cross. Now all the nations can come in for healing. This is the same event being repeated multiple times. This is the finished work of Jesus. The city of God is not a city floating out of the sky. It's symbolic for the church. And the church has its doors wide open for anyone to come and taste the healing of the fruit. He goes on to say this, blessed are those who wash their robes, meaning you ain't getting in except through Jesus Christ, so that they may have the right to the tree of life and that they may enter the city by the gates. Outside are the dogs and the sorcerers and the sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. Again, this is circular. He's describing the same event in a different way. But the gates are never shut the church says come, but only through Jesus Christ do you wash your robes. Remember when Jesus said, I am the gate and the shepherd of the sheep pen. He is always open to people repenting and coming to believe the good news. Now, here's the thing. I set all this up, and I told you a couple weeks ago, the early church fathers did not use revelation for their end times theories. They did not use it. They talked about it. It really picked up in America. But listen to what Augustine said about Revelation. The book of Revelation should only be included in the canon of scriptures, the Bible, if it is not interpreted literally and never used to predict the future. That's all we've done. This is not a literal book. It's apocalyptic hyperbole describing the same event. John was warning the churches not to give in to Caesar and not to give in to religion. That's what the whole book's about. But what they did use was 1 Corinthians 5. The early church fathers used 1 Corinthians 5 for their end times theology. So view this through the lens of hope. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. He makes no distinction between believers and unbelievers. It's everyone who's ever died. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. Now listen to this. For as in Adam all die. That's all of us. That's all of humanity. But also in Christ shall all be made alive. Same word, all means all. But each in his own order. So now he's giving you the timeline, okay? Christ, the first fruits, then at his coming, those who belong to Christ, the believers. Then comes the end, when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and every power. He is talking about like the spiritual realm, by the way, like Satan. For he must reign until he has put all enemies under his feet. Now, let's just stop and think. Do you know that the Bible says we were all enemies of God? All of us were enemies of God. And so he's hinting that he won't stop until all of us are in subject to his kingdom. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. It's over. It's done. For God has put all things subjection under his feet, but when it says all things are put in subjection, it's plain that he is ex accepted who put all things in subjection under him. He's saying the Father is not below Jesus. When all things are subjected to him at the end of time, then the Son himself will also be subjected to him who put all things in subjection under him. Now listen to this. That God may be all and in all. Everybody. So, there are 70 plus verses in the Bible that talk about ultimate restoration, and we're gonna go through every single one of them right now. Just kidding, we're not gonna do that. We're only gonna cover some, okay? But we're gonna, I'm gonna show you a flow of scripture. You've heard me say this, that you can't pick out one verse and make whole theologies. You need to see the whole flow of scripture. The book of Isaiah has a lot of destruction in it, but right next to it, it always talks about restoration. So let's go back to the original covenant with Abraham. If you don't know who Abraham was, he was, um, he was a pagan. And he was around a culture who, like, basically, they worshiped the moon. And uh, they, they, all the cultures around him, by the way, were sacrificing their own children to their God. So, I mean, he was in a pretty rough neighborhood. <laughs> let's call that. But God calls him out, and God says, if, like, if you follow me, I'm going to bless the world. Now, listen to this. In Genesis 12, and I will make of you a great nation, Israel, and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you, I will curse. And in you, listen to this, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. 
all. So Abraham gets worried. Things aren't happening the way he wants. He's wondering if he heard God wrong. So God amplifies the promise. In Genesis 22, I will surely bless you and I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and as the sand on the seashore. And your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies and in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. Abraham was not the Messiah. He's talking about through his bloodline, the Jewish race, Jesus would come. But I want you to notice what it just says there. It says, it will be more than the sands of the seashore. We just came back from San Diego this week. We got to sit, spend a little time on a beach. How much sand is that? And then he says, like the stars of the heavens. So what he's saying is, if you want to know how many people are going to get in, why don't you go outside and look up, especially in Big Sky, Montana. How many stars are there? So when Christians say only a few are going to make it, how many stars is that? I'm sorry, I just spit all over you in the front row. I already had COVID in November, you're good. Uh, how much sand is that? From the very first covenant, God's trying to get into our heads being like, it's way more people than you think, guys. It just has to come through one bloodline, Jesus Christ. So let's look at Hosea now. We're walking through the Old Testament, we'll get to the New. Hosea, he says, come, let us return to the Lord, for he has torn us that he may heal us. He has struck us down and he will bind us up. After two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will raise us up that we may live before him. That's what we're gonna be celebrating next week. You should invite people to Easter. 8.30, 10, and 11.30. Hundreds of years before Christ walked the planet, he predicted he was going to rise from the dead. But notice what he says. He didn't say our religion's gonna do it, our repentance's gonna do it, nothing's gonna do it. Jesus himself is going to raise humanity up from the grave. Let's get into the Psalms. There's so many in the Psalms, but we'll just touch on a few. All the nations you have made shall come and worship before you. O Lord, and glorify your name. All. Praise is due to you, O God in Zion, and to you shall, shall vows be performed. O you, o you who hear prayer, to you shall all flesh come. When iniquities prevail against me, you atone for our transgressions. Now, Psalm 22 is what Jesus quoted on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And what he was doing was a rabbi trick where the rabbi would stand in front of the congregation and he would start the psalm and then they were supposed to repeat the rest back. So when Jesus said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He was telling the people in front of him on the cross, go read the rest of the psalm. Here's what Psalm 22, 27 says, all the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations shall worship before you. All. Everyone. It's pretty clear. Isaiah, again, Isaiah has a lot of destruction in it, but then it always comes into the redemption part. Isaiah 40, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Isaiah 25, on this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, a rich food full of marrow, of aged wine well refined. This sounds awesome. And he will swallow up on this mountain the covering that is cast over all peoples, the veil that is spread over all nations, and he will swallow up death forever. And the Lord God will wipe away tears from all the faces and the reproach of his people he will take away from all the earth for the Lord has spoken. All nations, all people. So let's take this lens, okay? This, this lens into the New Testament. First John 2. John was uh, the last writer of all the epistles and the gospels. Um, so he has a different view on some of these things, but that was Jesus' guy. 1 John 2, 2 says he is the propitiation for our sins. He's the payment. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. He didn't just die for a few. He didn't just die for people who were gonna say the prayer. He didn't just die for those who were gonna accept him. He died for the sins of the entire world. Now, most New Testament uh, books are written by the Apostle Paul. And so he has an authority. The Apostle Paul has an authority in, in, in things of Christ. 
And he wrote a book called Romans. And I don't know if you remember this, but if you've been a Christian a while, but we, we were taught to do the Romans road. They'd give us a little track and the Romans road was you walk them through a few passages in Romans to try to get them to be saved, right? It's great. Let me give you a different Romans road, okay? So again, remember, these letters were read from front to back in front of the church. They didn't just stop in chapter three. There was no chapter three. This was a sermon that was read in front of the entire church. So let's go first Romans five. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification in life for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. Now the law came to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. As humanity kept sinning, grace kept going like this. All means all. Go all the way to Romans 11. He says, I do not want you to be unaware of this mystery, brothers. A partial hardening, meaning the Jews rejecting Christ, has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And in this, all Israel will be saved. Romans 11:32. For God has consigned all to disobedience that he may have mercy on all. Go to Hebrews. Hebrews says, for they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest, all. Here's a big one, okay? First Timothy 2. This is good, and it is pleasing in the sight of our God and Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of truth. The question you need to ask yourself is, does God get what he wants? So Calvinists believe that God is sovereign and you're, if God wants you, he's gonna get you. That verse kind of hurts their viewpoint because does he get what he wants or not? And you know what God wants? All of you. This was a huge verse for me, huge verse for me, a game changer. And I was listening to a debate between this English pastor, I think he was from, um, you know, Orthodox English pastor, and he had a guy getting really fiery with him because for some reason, Christians, even the thought of all people getting to heaven really bugs some Christians. And he was all up in this guy's face like, how can you believe this? How can you believe this? Now, I'm gonna do an English accent and I'm going to destroy this English accent. My brother Paul, I'm very sorry if you're here today. Okay, we actually have someone from England here and he can ridicule me, that's fine. So this guy's up in his face like, well, why do you believe all men will eventually get in? And this guy, this older gentleman with this big smile says, well, the Bible says that God desires all men to be saved. The Bible also says that God can save all men. Therefore, if he wants to and he can, I believe he will. <laughs> My wife's super turned on right now. Uh, <laughs> she loves Eng English accents, English accents. You can say anything in an English accent. You're like, that was brilliant, right? I know that sounds so simple, what I just said to you, but it makes so much sense. And I remember looking at this being like, okay, this guy has these degrees from Oxford and he said it in such a simple way. God says he desires all men to be saved. He says he can, therefore he will. I'm like, that was a game changer for me from this verse right here. Let's go to Colossians. Colossians 1. For God is satisfied to have all his fullness dwelling in Christ. And by the blood of his cross, everyone say everything. Everything in heaven and earth is brought back to himself, back to its original intent, restored to innocence again. He's talking about the cross. And so some of you are looking around being like, well, the world doesn't look like it's restored because people don't know. Why do we share the good news? So they can feel restored. They can believe it. And then when you believe that you're forgiven, when you believe you're saved, your actions will start following. Colossians 2, he canceled out every legal violation we had on our record and the old arrest warrant that stood to indict us. He erased it all. 2,000 years ago, do you realize your sins were already covered before you were born? 
our sins, our stained soul. He deleted it all and they cannot be retrieved. We're always trying to bring up the old ones, right? I think so many times, I, dude, on our judgment, some people think he's gonna bring up like September 14th, 2005. I don't know what that date was, but I probably did something naughty. <laughs> and he'll be like, I'll be like, yeah, but you remember when I did this? He'll be like, I don't know what you're talking about. Remember when I said this to my kids? No. What? It was canceled, never to be retrieved. That's the good news I'm sharing with you every week. That's good stuff, man. <laughs> it's just so good. Everything we once were in Adam has been placed onto his cross and nailed permanently there as a public display of cancellation. Ephesians 1, making known to the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth, all things united in him. C.S. Lewis writes this, for he claims all because he is, he is love and must bless. He cannot bless us unless he has us. When we try to keep within us an area that is our own, we try to keep an area of death. Therefore, in love, he claims all. There's no bargaining with him. He's gonna get you. He's gonna get you with his love and grace. That's just how it is. So what about Jesus? That's our guy. That's who we look to. The hard part about Jesus is he talked in parables. He just did. And the first thing you learn in Bible school is you can't make full doctrines on parables. <laughs> and I'm like, that's always kind of hard because that's all he talked about. So let's look at one parable, okay? There's one parable where he talks about an unforgiving servant where uh, this guy owes this debt. It's like the, the, the Greek is like, it's in the billions. He could never pay it back. And so his master forgives him a debt that he could never repay, the cross. Then that servant goes out and he starts harassing the other servants who owe him money. So even though he was forgiven, he didn't show forgiveness back. And Jesus says this then, and in his anger, in, in, and in anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. So also my heavenly father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. So a couple things on this. First off, we're always so worried if our sins are forgiven. The heart of Christ is if you see your brother needs forgiveness. We are so self-centered in America. It's always about us being forgiven. He's like, why don't you go cover your brother's sins? Because that's what I did. So see, we're always worried if, I, if we're in or out. He's like, go, go forgive them. Go show them their forgiveness. But notice what it also says there. They will pay every last penny, but they will get out but they will get out. Remember when Jesus looked at the Pharisees, the religious ones, and he said, the tax collectors and prostitutes are gonna get in before you do. One thing we miss in that passage is, that means they'll get in. It just means you think you were gonna be first because you kept all this religious stuff and all these rules. You're so pure, I'm so impressed. You're gonna be last, buddy. <laughs> That's pretty much what he was saying. So I'm convinced, I seriously am convinced as I see who Jesus hung out with and what he said, some of the people that we think are so messed up because we see their flesh and we see some of the things they're doing and saying, they might actually be some of the first ones in because they get grace. So go have all the sin you want. Just kidding, that's not what I'm saying, okay? That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is I think sometimes we delude ourselves to think like this, this religious thing is really impressive to Jesus when it's not. But notice it says they will get in. So many verses we can look to at Jesus, but in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whosoever believes in him will not perish, be annihilated, but have everlasting life. What we always forget is right before that, he says, the father has given all judgment to me and I came to judge no one. Jesus clearly said, I'm not here to judge you. I'm here to save you. So he says, I'm not here to judge. Then in John 12, right before he goes to the cross, he writes this, he says, and I, when I am lifted up from the earth on the cross, I will draw all men to myself. All means all. That means some like little tribe over in Africa that we ain't never heard of, he's drawn them. That means somewhere in Russia, he's drawn them. That means even in Haver, Montana, it's like Siberia, he's drawing them. Here's the interesting part about this verse. That word draw in Greek is helkuo. 
it means to drag. Let me phrase it in a fatherly way. Hey, you little sinners, when I'm lifted up, I'm going to drag your butt into heaven. It literally means drag. Some people are so bogged down by evil and sin, they're going to come in kicking and screaming, but a good father's like, let's go. Seriously, that's what it means. I will drag all men to myself. Drag. How about we just don't let them drag us, we just come in and love them, right? How about that? Here's a big one, when I mean the, uh, the spiritual side of things, okay? This isn't directly saying it, but if you think in the spirit, it does. Luke 15. What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he lost one of them, does not leave the 99 in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors saying to them, rejoice with me for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Or what woman having 10 silver coins, if she loses one, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and seek diligently until she finds it? First off, do you realize God just compared himself to a woman, which back then got Jesus in a lot of hot water. And when he has found it, when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors saying, rejoice with me for I have found the coin that I had lost. Just so I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. A couple things there. One, it's interesting to me that she threw a party that cost more money than the coin she found. There's something else going on here. Also, what did the sheep and the coin do to be saved? Nothing. They just found it. It was lost in the corner. And they, she didn't stop till she found it. That sheep was lost, put it on its shoulders, brought it home. It did nothing. But here's the biggest one. Did it ever lose its value because it got lost? It was always owned by the woman. The sheep was already the shepherd's. It didn't lose its value. It didn't change species. It was always that. This was a big one for me because, um, I should be a little careful, but when I first went on this journey five years ago and just started really researching this and having questions because a lot of you understand what I'm saying. When you're raised in church, there's some things you just can't question. And it's a, it's a power move that pastors do in denominations and churches. It's to keep people in line. It's nonsense. It's wrong. The church, her gates are never shut. You can come and go as you please. I'm not here to force you to do anything. And the churches did, and they have. And I'm sorry that that's happened to some of you. It's ridicule. It's shame. It's control. They like to keep you in fear sometimes. And we were raised with that. And I went on this journey and I started really studying the history. And I just, I'm like, God, this isn't lining up with your character. It's just, I know you. And my wife for a whole year kind of thought I was a heretic. I mean, she never just said that, but she was wrestling and struggling with what I was going through because she grew up in the assemblies of God and she had the fear of hell over her all the time. I mean, she told me about this thing that they did at their church where they brought in this play. Some of you might've seen it, but they brought this play in where it was like heaven or hell, where are you gonna go and just scare the living daylights out of children to receive Christ. It's just like, man. And so she really wrestled with what I was going through. And then I'll never forget, she was reading that verse about the lost coin and the lost sheep. And she had a little tear going down her eye. And she said, I get it. She goes, Scotty, what if the 99 and the one just means he ain't gonna stop until he finds every last one? He will never quit. And it was this wonderful moment between us and it united us in what we were going through. But Jesus said this in Luke 19, he said, for the son of man came to seek and save the lost. Is he going to fail? Or is he going to get every last one? Let's hope. Let's hope he's that good. 
So let me answer a few questions that I've heard over the years. Sometimes I, I'm, 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 more, I'm mature enough now to know when someone's asking a question and someone's making a statement. <laughs> so some of these have been asked not in nice ways, but that's okay. Here's some of the responses to universalism. If all roads go to heaven, then why did Jesus die? All roads don't go to heaven. The only way to heaven is through Christ, the blood of Christ. I love in the book, The Shack, he had this great line. Mac was kind of like, that sounds like universalism, like all roads. So what you're saying is all roads go to heaven. And Paul Young was a genius in how he phrased this. He said, most roads don't go anywhere, but I'll go down any road to find you. Oh. <laughs> it doesn't mean all roads lead to heaven. The prophet Muhammad is going to bow his knees to Jesus Christ. It just means it all goes to one spot. So why did Jesus have to die? To defeat death and Hades. And not only that, is so we allow him to work and defeat death and Hades right here and right now inside of us. It's so we could live the kingdom now. It's so we can't suffer in this sin, in this bondage now. That's why he died. If everyone gets in, this is the one that gets me. <laughs> if everyone just gets in, then why are we doing this? I've heard that one so many times from people. Why are we being missionaries? Why are we doing this? Like, what I hear is I'm working really hard for Jesus. And what, forgive me, but are you? <laughs> First off, are you? Is that really what this is about? Why am I giving my money? Why am I doing this if everyone just walks in? Because you love people. Because the kingdom is now. Jesus clearly said over and over, the kingdom is now, the kingdom is now, the kingdom is now. Jesus Christ is redeeming this planet, guys. I know a lot of you just can't wait to get out in space somewhere. He's redeeming this place. I'm going to restore all things. And there's so many people in this world who are living in hell right now. I want, I want them to know Jesus now. Not just in the afterlife. I want their marriages to get better now. I want them to know how to use their money now. I want them to be generous now. I want them to get over certain things now. Because Jesus is the son of God now. At the Great Commission in Matthew 28, did Jesus say, go into all the world and save people? He says, go into all the world and make disciples. Why didn't he tell us to save people? Because he already did. He said, go teach him about generosity, about compassion, about mercy, about the kingdom way, about loving your enemies, about turning your other cheek. Go make disciples. He never told you and I to save people. He did. He's the one who went to hell. He's the one who conquered death. Now we share that good news that you don't have to be afraid of death, which is probably a good message right now. In 2021, in 2020, everyone's freaked out. He's like, yeah, you're gonna die someday, but that's just the beginning. That's not the end. You're resurrected. That's the beginning. That's why we share it. When I hear people say, then why are we even having church and doing this if everyone just walks in? That screams religion to me. Why am I doing this? So let me just phrase this in a different way. Maybe you don't like being a Christian. I'm serious. If that's your view, that you're just suffering for the Lord, Maybe you don't actually like doing this because being a Christian is hard. But that screams religion. Why am I working so hard? <laughs> I'm like, what? Because you love people. And may I say this also? Maybe if you have that viewpoint, you're jealous because you kind of miss partying, you kind of miss doing your thing, you kind of miss all that. Maybe you're jealous of the world because they seem free and they can do whatever they want. There's one group of people called the Moravian Brotherhood, who are universalists. There has not been a place on this globe they haven't gone and shared the gospel. Why are they doing it then? Look at their symbol, their, their like logo. That's their logo, the conquering lamb. Us Americans, we want the lion. Get the lion out. Let's shred it up. That's their logo, the lamb slain before the foundations of the earth. And they have been persecuted in Poland and, and Belgium, all over the world they've had to flee because they're being murdered. So why would they do that? Why would they murder them if they're telling them that God saved them? Because people don't like to change and they don't like to be told they're sinners. That's why. 
People don't want to be told they need saving. But they still did it. Now listen to why they did it. When, when asked, why would you guys go share the gospel around the world if you thought everyone was going to get in eventually? It says this, the simple motive of the brethren for sending missionaries to distant nations was an ardent desire to promote a salvation of their fellow men by making known to them the gospel of our Savior Jesus Christ. It grieved them to hear of so many thousands and millions of the human race sitting in darkness and groaning beneath the yoke of sin and the tyranny of Satan, remembering the glorious promises given in the word of God that the heathen also shall be the reward of the suffering and death of Jesus. That's why. Because people are living in darkness now. People are struggling now. People are committing suicide right now. And they need to hear the hope of Jesus Christ. Another one I've heard, universalism will cause people to sin. They'll just go sinning if everyone thinks they're going to get in. As I said a few weeks ago, is the concept of hell stopping people from sinning anyways right now? So look, maybe, maybe. If you're going to sit there and say, yeah, well, if I'm just getting in, I'm going to do whatever I want. Well, you're going to ruin your life here. You're going to be kind of a creep, and you're going to suffer for it in the afterlife. But here's the other side. I have actually seen the opposite happen. Here's why. My dear brothers and sisters, our church is known as hyper grace. I've been told that so many times. Oh, you guys are just hyper grace. Proudly. Proudly. When I read Romans where it says, where sin abounded, grace abounded all the more, yes, I'll take hyper grace. When I read a verse that says, higher than the depths and the seas and the oceans and everything is his love, I'll take hyper grace. I will proudly be hyper grace because we're all so screwed up. And what I've seen at this church, there's things that have happened at this church that you guys don't even know about. And I don't come on stage and say it because I'm not going to shame the person. But what we have seen at this church over and over is people hide their sins at other churches of leadership or whatever because they know if they confess them, they're going to be fired. They're going to be, they're going to be kind of sh shamed. Because we, we have this weird American view in church that everything is supposed to be neat and orderly and everything has to present it well to the community. We have to look like we're playing the part. I would rather just play the part. And so what I have seen at this church is people who have hid sins for so long and then they hear this message of grace and they completely screw their lives up here because they know it's a safe place to do it. They know that they can actually screw up here and we're never gonna kick them out, shun them, or shame them. So I've actually seen the grace of Jesus expose more sin than any shame and judgmental preaching. Next week in Easter, I'm actually doing something different. I'm preaching on Peter on the boat. Remember when Peter was on the boat and he was like, okay, Jesus, I'll throw this net on the right side. And then he caught a bunch of fish and it says, he said, away from me, Jesus. Why would he say that? Because grace exposed who he was. And what did Jesus say to him? Get up, man, let's go. Okay, I've seen the opposite. I've seen the opposite of grace. Grace makes people screw up because they know they can. And until you admit you're screwed up, you can't get better. That's the point of grace. I actually believe that the sinner's prayer in the American gospel has caused more laziness because they're like, well, I said the prayer, so I'm good. I'm like, are you? I said the prayer. I said the prayer. I got baptized. I did this. And I'm like, wow, man, you, your sanctification happened quick. And what I've really seen is when you get a bunch of stuff out of your life and you become judgmental and fundamental, you just traded one sin for the next. You might've got rid of pornography in your life, which is an amazing feat, but then you can start judging people who look at pornography. I've seen it, I've done it. Grace just says, you're all screwed up, man. I have consigned all to disobedience that I might have grace on all. How about we just admit we are entirely screwed up people and we need the grace of Jesus Christ. Yes. <laughs> Paul addressed this. Paul addressed this. Do we continue to sin because we're Christians? No. Paul said, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? Like the Romans were so screwed up. They're like, hey, this grace thing's awesome. We should sin more so we get more grace. And Paul's like, dummies, dummies, dummies. By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us have been baptized into Christ Jesus, were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. 
We're following Jesus not to get a get out of hell free card. It's so we can start living a new life here. But what I love about Paul is Paul always started every epistle out with, you're the best. You guys are amazing. I'm hearing reports of you all throughout the world. But could you guys stop being such dweebs? But Paul never questioned their salvation, not once. Because he's like, Jesus saved you. Here's Ephesians. For by grace you have been saved through his faith. That's the real Greek, his faith, Jesus's. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Grace is grace. I know we can't understand this because we're Americans. We're like, yeah, but it's grace and I got to do this. No, it's just grace. It's given to you. If you think you said the sinner's prayer and that saved you, then that's a work. If baptism was it, then that's a work. It's by grace and grace alone you have been saved. So here's the bigger question with this. If everyone gets in, then why are everyone's going to start keep sinning? Do you want your sin cured or covered? That's the question you need to ask yourself. Do you want your sin cured or covered? Because Jesus didn't call himself the great covering. He called himself the great physician because he's here to heal us. Okay? So just because universalism is a possibility, it doesn't mean that everyone's going to go around sinning. We're already going around sinning. So ask ask yourself a question then. Because here's the main thing I get, that we're soft on sin at Zootown. That's not true. Anyone who knows me knows I have many opinions. And my whole thing is this. Right now in our culture, and I'm struggling with Christians right now, because I want to ask you, what thing is the world putting out that you're not in agreement with at this point? So I hear this word a lot, resist, resist, resist. We're part of the resistance. If your values are lining up with Hollywood and music and politicians, you are not part of the resistance, my friends. You are going along with the flow. And everything you see in our society right now with everything has already been tried. Sex, gender, everything has been tried already. So you're not part of the resistance. And what I'm just saying is, like, it doesn't mean we're soft on sin. But what I know is this is going to go to hell in a handbasket. In 10 years, some of these things that people are promoting right now as healthy are going to destroy people's lives. And they're going to be like, they're going to be hurting people. So what's the church's job? To welcome them in and say, by grace, you have been saved. I'll take hyper grace all day, all day over judgmental, self-righteous fundamentalism. The last one that I hear all the time is this tickles the ears. Oh, how many people have commented on our social media pages? My ears are being tickled. That ultimate reconciliation is tickling the ears because it's what the world wants. Are you stinking kidding me? The world wants everyone to go to heaven? Our world wants vengeance. Our world wants justice. Our world wants punishment. You think people wanted Mr. Obama to go to heaven? You think people want Donald Trump to go to heaven? A couple of mo- a month ago when Rush Limbaugh died, the leading Twitter trend was rest and piss. We are a vengeful, violent, angry people. We have our congressmen just judging each other, judging each other. We do, this is not a worldly idea. A worldly idea is they messed up, burn them. How many uh, celebrities do we have to see? They raise them up, they tear them down. They raise them up, they tear them down. Free Britney, free Britney, free Britney, right? She should be free, by the way. <laughs> this is not, this doesn't tickle the ears. But what I have learned in 12 years of preaching, you know what does tickle the ears? I'm in and you're out. I'm chosen, you're not. I have the right doctrine. I have the right theology. I have the right this. That is what tickles the ears. Grace does not tickle the ears. Woo! Finally, when people say to me, well, if everyone just walks into heaven, which they don't, even if they did though, that sounds awesome. They say, this is too easy. Cheap grace. This is too easy of a grace if everyone just gets in. Really? Look at this picture. Does this look easy to you? It cost God's life. That is something you and I will never, ever go through. This is not easy. 
for Jesus Christ to save all of humanity and bring them out from the grave, that was not an easy task. It says he went through every temptation you and I did, and he never sinned. Does that sound easy to you? This is not an easy grace. Here's one more famous verse that changed me on this view in Philippians 2. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Every person will bow their knee. Every person will confess Jesus is Lord. Now, let me ask you, in our American worldview, we say, yes, see, our enemies are gonna bow their knee to Jesus Christ. Or from a lens of grace, we can be like, yes, everyone's going to do it. Because you either believe that Jesus pulls people out of hell, makes them bow, and then sends them back. Why would he do that? For his own pride? God doesn't need us. We're little peons. We're nothing. He's going to pull you out of hell and be like, now that you've bowed to me, away from me. That makes no sense. And here was the game changer for me. When I found out that the Greek translation for confess is joyfully confess. I think I had a slide. I didn't show it last uh, sermon, but just to prove it to you, I took a picture of my concordance. To acknowledge openly and joyfully. Is there joy in hell? So why are people joyfully confessing Jesus is Lord? Maybe because after some punishment and they figure it out, they're like, yippee, <laughs> I'm ready, God. The bigger question is why did our American translations take that out? Because it didn't fit with their theology. Here's the deal, guys. I have, I have, <laughs> I've hung, I've been, I've hung with the torture crowd, with the judgmental crowd, the crowd that, that, that thinks, Billions of people are going to be lost. And some have done it gleefully, like they're excited about it. I've been that person. And I see fear in them. I see anger in them. I see a big log in their eye because they'll call me a heretic or you a heretic or anyone a heretic. And I'm like, look at how you're acting. <laughs> By sticking up for Jesus, you're acting very unchristlike. I've been with that crowd. And now I've hung with the universalist crowd. And they have a whole new compassion for people and the way they explain the gospel and the way that they just love people. Because what this view did for me was it helped me stop looking at people's actions and just looking at people. People loved by God. Again, anyone who knows me knows I am not soft on sin. There's things I majorly disagree with, but I can move past that and see a lost person. Because Jesus had this unique way of, of sharing the good news. He had this unique way of meeting people where they at, were at because he saw them as humans, not by what they were doing. So I've hung with the torture crowd and I've hung with the universalist crowd and I just see a peace with the universalist crowd. But this is one of the biggest ones for me was when I was in the middle of, of, of wrestling with this issue. I was, sitting, we, I was sitting there and Lily, my daughter Lily was there. She was about 10 years old. And out of nowhere, the Holy Spirit said to me, you need to come at this like a child. Because Jesus told us, in order to understand the kingdom of God, you have to become like a child. So I looked over at my daughter and I said, honey, like Jesus, Jesus is awesome, right? It's like, yeah, he's the best, right? Like, and, and she, she listed all these things she loves about Jesus. And I said, honey, I said, do you believe that Jesus is going to punish people and torture them in a place called hell? She just looked at me like I like I'd betrayed her. Like all I've done is tell her how amazing Jesus is and the love of God and the forgiveness of God. And now I'm like baiting, switching her. And she looked at me like I had horns growing out of my eyes. And she just goes, oh, no. Jesus would never do that. And I remember just like, I've, I don't know. I just, I, I was like, what are we doing here? <laughs> you know? 
Is this just to control people and to cause fear in people? Is this like so I can get a tally mark next Easter that we baptize this many? Or I mean, is that what American church is about? It's all about numbers. It's all about this. It's all about keeping people in control. Or is it about experiencing the love and the grace and the risen Lord, Jesus Christ? And that was a moment for me where I was like, man, if I'm supposed to be like a child and my own child sees Jesus, like he would never torture people. I said, okay, Lord, I can accept this. I can accept this. I know this is incredibly tough because of how you were raised. I was raised the same way. And I can tell you this journey has cost this church. It's cost my family. It's cost the armor dings. It's cost us. But once you see it, you, you can't, not see it. And I just believe he's that, he's that good. He's that amazing. A friend of mine sent me a quote by one of my favorite authors, Robert Capon. I'm just about done. And because I understand the scriptures, right? You can find one spot of the scripture that says this and another spot in the scripture that says this, right? And he writes this. He says, I am fully aware that the scriptures are paradoxical, that God speaks with a forked tongue, and that every lovely thing he says on the side of leniency can be matched by a dozen stringencies that will curl your hair. But I am also convinced that each of us has to make a decision about such utterances. You must then decide which of these words you will take as his governing word. You ask me why I think God's leniency governs his severity? Why grace is his sovereign attribute? Well, all I can say to you is that having been a father who has spoken out of both sides of his mouth to six children for 26 years, all I can say is that I put my bet on the left fork of the tongue. It is my best hope that when my children think of everything I have said and done to them, sorry, I'm leaking. <laughs> They choose to remember the times of my severity was when I just gave them a kiss on the cheek, poured myself a scotch, and shut up. And it is my last hope that God hopes the same for himself. It's just such a, a powerful quote that we, we warn our children. We discipline our children. We will drag our children places, right? But at the end of the day, as a father, do I want my children to remember the times that I had to threaten them, that I had to punish them? Or are they going to remember the times that I just forgave them and I just blessed them and I overlooked their events? That should be any father's heart, any mother's heart. How is our father's heart any worse? I think it's better. I think it's better. So, band, you come on up. I want to thank my. I want to thank our board at Zootown Church for allowing me to do this. A few years ago, I could not have done this. I want to thank our staff. I want to thank Chad. I want to thank just all our staff for sticking with us through this journey, and I want to thank you. Thank you, church, for having the maturity and the patience and the understanding to talk about this. We have such a great board, and we just, we have such a great staff. But as I said before, this, this cost us, this cost us, this journey cost us. But the Lord spoke to me a couple weeks ago and he said, this is it, this is it, this is the end. This is it. This is the final chapter that's being closed on the past things that have happened here. And he goes, I'm opening up something new. He flat out told me, he said, you think this is the end? It's not, it's the beginning of a new season at Zootown Church. Because we're going to talk about these things. We're going to discuss these issues. We're going to allow a safe space for all of you to ask these questions because we've all had them and we were told we couldn't even ask. A new season is at Zootown Church, and so I just want to tell you guys, thank you. I love this church. I really love this church. And 
I never want to go through what we had to go through to get here, but I'm so thankful that we did because we're a brand new place. This cost all of us. This cost Dan. Dan started talking about some of these things at his former place of employment, and he got fired for even talking about stuff like this. This cost his family. This cost him. He's my brother, and he came at the perfect time. And the way we can talk about stuff, we don't agree on everything. We don't. But at the end of the day, we get up and we give each other a hug because we agree on Christ. This cost my brother. It cost us friendships. We've been labeled everything you can imagine. <laughs> it was worth it. It was worth it to be able to share the awesomeness and grace of Jesus Christ. So here's my thing. Today's Palm Sunday. Today's the day that Jesus rode in on a donkey. And the significance of that is the Jews thought he was going to come with a sword on a stallion and destroy the Romans. And so they missed him. And my fear is we're still waiting for that Messiah to come back with a sword and kill people. He's not. He's here to save people. And the same way the Jews have missed him because of their culture, I think we can miss him too because of our culture. And it's time we just whitewash all that and just say, we're serious about this book and we're serious about following who Jesus truly is. Is it gonna cost us? Yes. But I promise you, learn from us. There's freedom on the other side of that journey. There's freedom on the other side of that pain. So I wanna end with two scenarios, okay? For hopeful universalism. For some reason, we think Adolf Hitler is the worst person to ever live. He was pretty bad. You read the Assyrians and the Babylonians, Hitler was child's play compared to what those guys did. The Assyrians used to skin the Jews alive. But let's use Hitler as an example. Hitler killed six million Jews. There's no sign that he was a follower of Christ. My guess is he went to hell. Here's the problem with that scenario when we talk about it. Those six million Jews, do you know that most of them weren't following Christ and they denied their own Messiah, so they went to hell too? We never talk about that side. So you got one scenario where you got Hitler burning in hell for all eternity and all those Jews next to him. What's the point? What's the point of that? Now let me give you another view from Ultimate Reconciliation. Hitler's punished. We don't know how long. Let's say it's for 6,000 years, right? 1,000 years for every Jew. Is that long enough for you guys? It's a long time. But Jesus has redeemed the Jews. He's redeemed, as in Romans, it says all Israel will be saved. And Hitler finally gets it. And he bows his knee to Christ. And who's waiting for him at the kingdom of God but all the Jews that he killed and they welcome him in. And full circle, all is redeemed, all is restored. Which view makes Christ look better? Which makes the cross look bigger? Which gives you more hope? Believe in the hope for your family members, for your loved ones, for people now, for people later, that Christ will redeem all things. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.